Well, welcome, guys, to another week of Alpha, another week of gathering together as, as God's church. And uh, this week's topic is how can I resist evil? And we're looking forward to that. There's a battle going on in our world. And uh, this will be a helpful topic for all of us. Um, as we come together, we're going to just say uh, happy Father's Day to all the dads. Hopefully you've had a good day today. And uh, I just want to leave us with a, a verse out of Colossians 2.7. It says this, Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. And uh, we just want to overflow with thankfulness to our Heavenly Father uh, tonight and just enjoy some time where we can praise and worship him. We'll enjoy our video as normal and then at the end we'll also go into our Zoom groups for some uh, great discussion really been enjoying those times together and being able to see you all face to face. So looking forward to that. Let me just pray as we enter into this space. Father God, we just thank you that you are our Father. We thank you that you love us uh, and we, we just think of um, so many uh, instances in the scripture that talk about your love for us. Um, and I, that, that visual of the, uh, the prodigal son returning to his father comes to my mind where the father comes running towards him and throws his arms around him and um, it's just this amazing picture of your love for us and we want to enter into that love tonight uh, we want to do that by worshipping you we want to do that by listening to your word through the video we want to do that by interacting together in community in Jesus name so we just want to hand ourselves over to you now Lord and uh, just pray that you would speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we uh, enjoy a time of worship, uh, and then we'll uh, head into the videos, and then also into our Zoom groups. Bless you guys. Hi, Padso. Welcome to church today. Uh, as a little treat, I brought my little sister Sophie along to play some music with me. So let's praise God together. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone. Cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's arms. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face. I rest on His unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil My anchor holds within the veil Rise the Cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord our Lord. When 
he shall come with trumpet sound oh may i then in him be found just in his righteousness alone fall is stand before the throne Christ alone, cornerstone, weak may strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone. Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord our Lord. You are the word at the beginning. The name of 
nothing can stand against What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus We have one more song to sing for you today, Pastor, and um, this is an awesome song that we actually don't really sing at church, um, but yeah, feel free to just relax and to reflect on the words that are being said. Uh, this song came out only a couple of weeks ago now, and Sophie and I have really fallen in love with it. It sings of the pride of a father um, and the love of the father that knows how broken that we are and uh, loves us the same. And this is even more um, yeah, relevant given that today's Father's Day. So let's play together. I could run a thousand miles to win the race of life, but what's the value without you? Yeah, I could write a thousand songs to captivate your heart, but more than offerings, Lord, you seek the depths of me. A pride ago, burdened by my shame, till you came running to remind me your love is unconditional, and in your eyes I'm worthy of forgiveness. What was lost is now redeemed, and you. Right. 
I'm thankful to Dad for all his great advice. I enjoy watching TV with my dad and the great chats that we have. I'm thankful that Dad, even though we can't do it now, that Dad takes me out to a cafe called Ollie and Me and we get little meals or snacks together. It's just the two of us. Happy, Happy Father's Day. Day! So Ellie, tell us, how much do you love Dad? To the moon and back. Cool, to the moon and back. And how much do you love me? To next door and back. To next door and back. That's awesome. <laughs> and tell us, what do you like doing with Dad? What's some of your favourite things to do? Snuggle time. And watching a movie together. And eating chocolates. Mm. Um, real. I love Dad because like, he's always there for me no matter what. And when I'm struggling in school or anything, like having troubles at um, school, he just helps me and just gets me through everything. Dad, because he always cares about us. One thing I love about my dad is how he would spend quality time with me through the creative process, uh, like building things uh, out, of, out of wood or, or fixing stuff with a car or trying to plan new things and draw stuff up. He just would always drop everything to help me explore that type of creativity and I think that's something I really admire about him and that I think he's passed on really well. So thanks dad for being available. So what are some of the things that you love about Dad? I really love him. I really, he sings silly songs. What else? Um, I think that's it. Hello everyone and welcome to Sunday Church. I'm Lisa, just bringing the announcements to you on this uh, first day of September. And we do want to say a very happy Father's Day to people in our community who are fathers or father figures. We are not having our morning tea Zoom catch up, which we had last week, because we are encouraging people to uh, catch up with their fathers and loved ones today. We want to say happy birthday to uh, several people in our community this week and a very special happy birthday to Kevin, who is 50 today. We hope you have a really happy day. Our Alpha series is continuing in our evening service. Uh, it is wrapping up soon, but we do have that tonight uh, on our live stream at 6.30, followed by our Zoom discussion groups after that. Uh, we have been talking about Open Doors and the work that it's doing uh, supporting the persecuted church around the world and particularly at the moment they are providing Bibles to people who would uh, not be able to access Bibles otherwise. If you would like to support that work there is a link available in our email coming after the service if you'd like to support that. We have heard from Millard this week about how uh, Lebanon is going at the moment. He did share as a country it is uh, in a very difficult position, uh, lots of issues happening uh, like electricity being cut off, water being cut off, very difficult to get medicine, uh, a real sense of discouragement across the whole country and his church has lost some people who have moved overseas or elsewhere 
so there are challenges in Lebanon so he would really appreciate if you would like to pray for Lebanon as a country and for the church that he has been working with over there. Just a reminder that we can still support and care for each other uh, remotely so consider who you can call or text or email or um, pray for this week if there's someone that you know in need who could benefit from a hamper please contact the church as well so that we can organize that we'd love to pray with you if you um, would like to join there is a zoom link in the live stream for a zoom prayer opportunity after the morning service that is continuing today just a prayer opportunity this week if you don't really want to do that you can also call the church and one of the pastors can pray with you over the phone just a reminder about our uh, the ways that you can contact the church so they are on the screen you can call or email we have a facebook page um, yep and got and we want to pray for our offerings the offering details remain the same so let me just pray lord god we we want to take this opportunity to remember that you are our father we want to thank you for that relationship that we have with you we want to thank you that you are trustworthy and true that we can always rely on you to look after us and to provide what we need we know that the uh, things are so challenging right now but we choose you we choose to put our trust and our hope in you we offer ourselves to you as gifts that you would work in us and through us that you would grow uh, christ likeness in us and we pray for opportunities to bear your hope into our world and so we pray as we give ourselves, as we give our financial gifts and supporting the church, that you would just be with us and grow us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. say no to that one. <laughs> no. Like well, you've got heaven and hell, I don't really know my thoughts on that. I do believe in negative forces, but not necessarily one man called the devil. I believe in karma. I believe that people who do bad things will get what's coming to them. I think that every human being is capable of wonderful things and terrible things, and it's just what you nurture. If there is a higher good power, and if I can believe in that higher good power, then I think I must give space for some amount of belief, you know, in evil as well. No, not really, but I do believe in monsters. Why do I think bad things happen? Oh my gosh. It's the luck of the draw. It just happens. We live in an imperfect world, so... It's just bad luck. I think it's principle of nature, because we have good things, of course we have bad things. The guy I know, Bruce, came on Alpha. He was very intelligent and also very sceptical. He was an atheist and nothing convinced him otherwise until the talk, How Can I Resist Evil? And at the end, he said, I'm a lawyer, and in my practice as a lawyer, I see so much evil. I've always believed in the power of evil. But now I realize that if there's a power of evil, it's only logical to believe in a power of good. Some people find it very easy to believe in evil and the devil. William Peter Blatty, who wrote the screenplay for The Exorcist, said this, as far as God goes, I'm a non-believer, but when it comes to the devil, well, that's something else. The devil keeps advertising. The devil does lots of commercials. Yeah, the Apostle Paul speaks about spiritual forces of evil that are at work in the world today. And the claim in the New Testament is that just as behind good is God himself, so behind evil is the devil. Now that might sound a bit far-fetched, but for some it's easier to believe in the devil than it is to believe in God. 
I was an atheist. I had great difficulty believing that God could exist. I became a Christian. I came to believe in God. But then somebody said to me that there's a devil. And I thought, come on. It's hard enough to believe there's a God, let alone to believe that there's a devil. Part of the problem is that I had a false image of God and of the devil. I had a picture of God as an old man with a beard sitting on a cloud. Similarly, I had a false image of the devil. I thought of the devil with horns, a tail, cloven hooves, and a pitchfork. Of course, those images of God and of the devil are not only unbelievable, they're also unbiblical. The New Testament talks about a, a triple alliance, like the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world's the enemy around us. It's all the evil that's around us, the world that's turned away from God. The flesh is the enemy within us. The flesh is not the body. There's nothing evil about the body. It's the evil desires that come from within each of us. And the devil is the enemy above. Jesus clearly believed in the existence of the devil. He taught his disciples to pray, deliver us from the evil one. Jesus himself was tempted by the devil. So scripture talks about the existence of the devil. Also tradition, Christians down the ages have always believed in spiritual forces of evil. And you may have had this experience, particularly if you've had a powerful experience of the Holy Spirit, you suddenly find that there seem to be all kinds of things coming against you, temptations that you weren't really aware of before. There's also common sense. How do we explain so much evil in the world? We live in a world where, where terrible things happen. Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire was part of the UN peacekeeping force in Rwanda, and he witnessed the genocide there in 1994. Because he had only a small number of officers, he was unable to stop it. Afterwards, he wrote a book and he called it Shake Hands with the Devil. He wrote this, I know that there's a God because in Rwanda I shook hands with the devil. I've seen him, I've smelled him, I've touched him. I know the devil exists, and therefore I know that there's a God. There are two equal and opposite dangers when we think about evil. One danger is complete disbelief, and the other is an unhealthy and excessive interest in the powers and the practices of evil. Things like Ouija boards, tarot cards, horoscopes, palm reading, that kind of thing. People who are on a spiritual search often experiment with these kind of things. It's not the unforgivable sin, but if you do it, then turn from it, repent from it, get rid of any books or anything in your life associated with it, because we're not supposed to have an unhealthy interest with these things. Yeah, the devil wants to destroy our lives. Jesus described the devil as a thief who wants to rob us. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That is his ultimate aim. It's the complete opposite of what Jesus wants for your life. Jesus loves you. He said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That's what God wants for you, fullness of life. The devil's aim is to destroy and he uses clever tactics. It's never obvious at the start where he's trying to take you. I was accused of murder when I was 15. At 16 year old, I eventually went to jail and I went to a detention center called Medemsley. It was very, very harsh. In that place, I was told what to do and I wouldn't do it. I was anti-authority. I had, I had a lot of physical beatings in there. I was put in solitary confinement a lot and, and it didn't help me. I just thought these people were bullies. So when I got out of there, I was more angry than when I went in. I was an embarrassment to my mother. She said, you know what? She said, you're the son of Satan. You're evil. She said, you're worse than your father ever was. Now that was bad to me because my dad was very violent and my mum often raped her. So for me, for her to say I was worse than my dad, it was the son of Satan and just got me really angry. And so my next step was to become a football hooligan. I started getting slashed, I got cut up across my face, I had my little finger chopped off. I was stabbed four times in the arm and chest. I've had a bottle in both eyes, I've got no front teeth. I had both my shoulders, my arms pulled out my sockets. It was anarchy. They loved to fight the things I did, which 
I couldn't mention really. But I did some very, very, very seriously evil things. I was evil. I was sheer evil. The devil wants to lead us on a path to destruction. So what are the devil's tactics? Well, the first is doubt. All of the important things in life require faith, and therefore they're open to doubt. And the devil wants us to doubt our beliefs and believe our doubts. But God wants us to doubt our doubts and believe our beliefs. The devil lies and causes us to doubt who we are and who God is. Jesus describes the devil as a liar and the father of lies. In the Garden of Eden, in the opening chapters of Genesis, which is really an expose of how evil works, the devil is described in terms of a serpent whose opening line to humanity is, did God really say? He casts doubt on what God has said. We see that really clearly with Jesus. At his baptism in the River Jordan, the words of the Father come from heaven. This is my son, whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. And immediately afterwards, Jesus is led out into the desert and the devil comes to him and his opening line is, if you are the son of God. In other words, the devil tries to make Jesus doubt his identity. The devil will try to get you to doubt God's goodness, to persuade you that God is a spoil sport who just wants to ruin all your fun. He lies about God's identity and about yours. And if he can get you to doubt your identity as a Christian, as a child of God, then he will. Yeah, many of us struggle with self-doubt. It lies about ourselves that other people have told us and we've ended up believing about ourselves. But our true identity is that we are children of God, deeply loved by our Heavenly Father and created in His image for a unique purpose. Another tactic of the devil is temptation. And all of us experience temptation to some degree. Booze and sex and all that sort of stuff. There's a lot of things that tempt me. Lying to people. I get very angry most of the times. I'm not gonna lie, a lot of girls. Shops. <laughs> yeah. Being mean, rude. Procrastinating. Oh, my greatest temptation is cheating. If you think about it, all the good stuff is bad for you. All the bad stuff is good for you. The women like, I guess. Going out and buying lunch every day instead of just making it myself. I try to change though. I try to like, kind of focus on like, what really matters, but. The kind of quick fix is very tempting, but I try and... So you can either withdraw from it and just ignore it, or you can go for it and see what happens. There's nothing wrong with being tempted. Everybody's tempted. You can't go through life without experiencing temptation. Jesus was tempted in every way, just like us, except he was without sin. So it's important to make the distinction between temptation and sin. The New Testament makes it clear that it's the devil who tempts us, not God. So in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, Satan is described as the tempter. Occasionally we have a thought that comes into our minds and we think, where did that come from? That's not sin. It's only sin if we adopt it and act on it. But the devil makes us think that we've already messed up and now it doesn't matter what you do because you've already fallen. Then there's a tactic of deception. All sin is a form of deception. Again, in Genesis, where the devil, in the form of a serpent, says, you will not surely die if you disobey God. In other words, it's not gonna do you any harm. But the devil tries to deceive us into thinking that God doesn't love us or want us to have the best in life. Jesus wants you to have life in all its fullness. He loves you. He doesn't want you to experience evil. He wants you to experience good. Yeah, and one of the other titles of the devil is the accuser. He makes us doubt God's goodness and love. He tempts us to break God's commands, which are there for our own protection. And then he accuses and condemns us. There's a big difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. It's when we know exactly what we've done is wrong and we turn away from it and receive forgiveness. But condemnation is from the devil. Condemnation is when we just feel really bad about ourselves. But the New Testament tells us there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. On the cross, Jesus took the condemnation that we deserve upon himself so that we don't have to. Our position in the battle has changed. The Apostle Paul puts it like this. He has delivered us 
from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the Son he loves. In other words, you were in the dominion of darkness, where you could say, in a sense, the devil was in control. But through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, the moment you invite Jesus to come and be part of your life, he transfers you from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of Jesus, where Jesus is in control and there is total freedom. By 1995, I was a tramp and I didn't realise this then. The inside of my body was shutting down, so all I did was drink, take drugs, didn't eat. I didn't realise I was getting septicemia. I had malnutrition and dehydration. In March of 1996, some people turned up on the street and they said to me, do you know Jesus loves you? And I chased them. Jesus, my nana sang about Jesus when I was a kid. There was no such thing a week after they came back. And I seen these Christian men and women on the street for the next six months. One morning I woke up, it was just a normal day. And I got my drink and my drugs and I collapsed. I was rushed to the hospital. I was in a coma for six days. My mother was asked to come to the hospital. She went to the hospital. I was dead. I'd had my last rites on the sixth day. The consultant said to my mum, that there's nothing I can do. So she said, can I have a few more hours to think about it? So my mum went out of the room and there was a lot of people there come to say goodbye to me. And then Tony, my mate, said to my mum, there's some Christian lads here. And my mum went, well, what good is that going to do? How can that help him? He's dead. And they said, well, let us pray for him. So they went and prayed for me and they put their hands on my head. And they said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, give this man new life. And I woke up, sat up, pulled the mask out my mouth. I was alive come back to life but it wasn't just a miraculous waking up of the coma I woke up totally different I knew I'd never drink again I'd take drugs I smoked I wanted to help people I actually thought I'd gone insane to be honest and these Christian men said to me do you know what Graham you need to go on an alpha course so I said what's one of them we went on the day away so on the third talk on the afternoon and I stood up and I said Jesus this the exact words, I've never forgot it, it was November the 9th, 1996, a quarter to three. And I said, Jesus, and I, I've been told you love me, and I kind of believe that you love me, but it's not enough. I need to know something in my heart. And as I said that, and I said, sorry, will you come into my life? I fell back into my chair, and I was crying. I, I couldn't stop. At that moment, as them tears flooded out my eyes, I knew where I was from, I knew who I was, and I knew what I had to do. So that night at 10 o'clock, I went back to the streets of Middlesbrough, full of Jesus, and I began my ministry. That was 19 years ago, and ever since then, that's what I've done. I've gone, I've told people about Jesus, I've run 141 Alpha courses. There's a couple of things I say to people on the streets or in the prison when I first meet them because they're, they're full of doubt you know I was doubtful and I said well grandma how do you really know that you know you didn't just wake up out of a coma now maybe I did just come out of that coma by coincidence but I often say for the last 19 years why have I lived how I have you know where did the violence go where did the anger and the rejection and not knowing about love. Where did that go in one night? Jesus is supreme love. That's what changes, that's what changed Graham Seed. So if it changed Graham Seed, it can do it for anyone. So if we experience this transformation, then why do we still struggle with temptation? And why do we still struggle with evil? The decisive moment of the Second World War was D-Day, the 6th of June, 1944. At dawn, thousands of Allied troops began to pour onto these beaches under heavy enemy fire. Though many lives were lost, it was the great breakthrough. Essentially, it was the day the war was won. At the death and resurrection of Jesus, the ultimate victory was won. That was the decisive moment. And the moment you invited Jesus into your life, if you did that, the power of sin was broken. 
But the war didn't end there. There was a whole period of months of the mopping up operations until VE Day, Victory in Europe, on the 8th of May, 1945. In a sense, right now, we live between D-Day and VE Day. The victory has been won, but we're still in this period of the mopping up operations, which will only be complete once Jesus returns and when we get to meet him. And if your experience is anything like mine, when I first encountered Jesus, then a lot changed in my life. But there are other times that I struggle with things, and if I'm honest, I still struggle with them today. One time, a few months ago, I was uh, biking along Oxford Street, and um, uh, I was a little bit away from the pavement, because uh, I like to bike a little bit away from the pavement for various reasons, and there was a black cab. Do you know the taxi drivers in London, the black cabs? There was a black cab behind me who was getting really impatient, and he started hooting on his horn. And then he came right past me, because he thought I was holding him up. He came right past me, really close. And he shot past me, and as he went past, he shouted at me, you're in the way, move over. And something in my spirit I don't think it was the Holy Spirit, <laughs> said, get him. <laughs> so, the great thing about a bike is you, that the, the cars do have to stop at traffic lights. So he got caught at the traffic light and I managed to catch him up. And uh, as I got to alongside, he said, you, you're, you're in the way, you should move over. I said, what's your number? because I know they don't like being reported. I said, what's your number? At that moment, the light changed to green. He said, my number, and he drove off. And I thought, right, I am gonna get him. <laughs> so I started biking after him. And I was looking at, I was trying to learn his number, 58815. I'm gonna report him, 58815. And I could see, he was looking in his rear view mirror, trying to see what I, who, what I was doing. And uh, I managed to catch up and I got alongside him and he said, Nikki, you should keep to the rules. <laughs> I thought, did I hear that correctly? <laughs> he said, Nikki, you should keep to the rules. The next thing I knew, he was leaning out of his window, shaking his alpha manual like this. <laughs> so I went up to him and I said, have you done the alpha course? <laughs> he said, yes, I became a Christian on alpha two months ago. So he hadn't had much time for sanctification. <laughs> I said, oh, what's your name? <laughs> he said, my name's Dean. I said, so nice to meet you. <laughs> I said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> By this time, he was a mixture of anger and so quite interested to meet the person who he'd been watching on DVD for the last 10 weeks. <laughs> the passenger in the back of the cab was totally mystified. <laughs> so eventually he turned around and he said, this guy runs the Alpha course. It's inspirational. It's changed my life. <laughs> and as I biked off, I thought, I really have got a long way to go. <laughs> We're still in a battle. It's a process and it won't be complete until Jesus returns. So what's our defense? How do we fight this battle? Well, Paul says in Ephesians chapter six that to fight this battle, we have to be strong in the Lord. We have to put on the full armor of God. So effectively, the Bible is saying that we have to get rid of the bad habits and replace them with good ones. Stay close to Jesus. Keep your focus on Jesus with the belt of truth around your waist. Jesus said, I am the truth. 
This is the opposite of hypocrisy. It's authenticity, integrity, openness in your life. The breastplate of righteousness. Keep your relationships right. Keep short accounts. If you mess up, as we all do, ask God to forgive you and pick yourself up quickly. And the same with other people. If you fall out with someone else, deal with it quickly. Ask for forgiveness. Get it sorted out. Get involved in service with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Don't just sit around doing nothing. Get involved. Serve at church or in your community. Trust God in difficult times. Paul says, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. The devil's going to throw stuff at you, doubt, fears, anxieties, lust, all kinds of things. Keep on trusting. Don't give up your faith. Put on the helmet of salvation. Win the battle of the mind. Salvation means freedom, the freedom which Jesus brings. All these temptations tend to start in the mind. A thought becomes an action, an action becomes a habit, a habit becomes a destiny. Know your Bible. Soak yourself in the Word of God. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I really encourage you to get to know this book, to read it daily if you can. Use a hard copy, download the Bible in one year app, whatever works for you. Each time Jesus was tempted, he replied with a verse from the Bible. He knew the scriptures well, and he used it as a defense against the attacks of the enemy. Keep praying. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. Keep close to God through prayer. And lastly, stand firm together. There is no armor for the back. We're most vulnerable when we're running away, but far stronger when we stand together. The good news is you can do it. James says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We can overcome evil with good. That's how we attack. And one of the ways that we can do that is through forgiveness. In the prayer that Jesus teaches his disciples, known as the Lord's Prayer, he tells them to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Uh, forgiving someone is one of the hardest things that we can do, but there is such power in forgiveness. My name is Barty Emanuel, and I participated in the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. I murdered many Tutsi under the order of bad leadership and have spent six years in prison and four years in community service. While in prison, fellow prisoners invited me to try Alpha. I went, but struggled to engage. I realized I needed to tell the truth about what I had done and wrote a letter asking for forgiveness of the relatives of those I had murdered. Life was so hard after being released from prison. I found my wife with two children that were not mine and I faced many heartbreaking situations. I didn't know how I was going to live with the genocide survivors after what I had done. My heart was filled with agony loneliness and fear. Encouraged by Alpha in prison, I decided to do Alpha again. I learned that Jesus forgives and experienced love in a way I had never known before. With the help of a local pastor, I went to find Vincent, whose mother and grandmother I had killed, to ask for forgiveness. I now live in a village built for genocide survivors and perpetrators. Vincent lives in the same village. We have formed a friendship and I now experience peace like I haven't experienced it before. Day-to-day -day life continues to be a challenge, but I have found forgiveness and healing for the things that I have done. Paul writes, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't just go through life saying, I didn't do anyone any harm. That's not a great ambition. How about doing some good? There is so much injustice in our world. 
and so much that can happen when we fight evil with good, when we fight against injustice. Look at what other people have done in the past, inspired by the example of Jesus. Look how Shaftesbury changed the whole social condition of his nation in the 19th century. Look at Wilberforce, how he led the campaign to abolish slavery. Look at Martin Luther King Jr. and how he fought to bring an end to the segregation between black and white in North America. Look at Mother Teresa, who transformed so many lives by giving herself wholeheartedly to the service of the poor. This is not just for the great heroes of history. This is for you. Your life can make a real difference. Your life has a purpose. You can leave a legacy of transformed lives. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In Jesus' name. Well, I hope you've been challenged by tonight's video, How Do I Resist Evil? And there's a lot for us to think about there, isn't it? Um, because uh, that's an ongoing battle for all of us. But maybe there's some questions that have arisen um, during that video. So we're going to have an opportunity now as we go to our uh, Zoom discussion. Um, that uh, link will be put into the chat uh, of the YouTube page there. Um, please join us. We've got some great uh, questions to consider. Uh, we're going to finish with a worship song, though. Um, and then jump into those groups. Let me pray, um, then we'll worship, then we'll discuss some of those important issues from tonight's Alpha video. Loving Father, um, as we come to the end of our time together, thank you for what you're teaching us and reminding us of. Thank you for Father's Day. Uh, thank you for our dads. Uh, thank you for the blessing they are. And, and we think of you, um, our Father in heaven, who loves us greatly and empowers us to live out our faith in this world. Um, inspire our thinking, challenge our thoughts. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless everyone. Uh, jump into that Zoom discussion now and uh, have a great week as well if you're unable to do that. God bless. Bye. Praise our hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah a melody I raise a hallelujah heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes over the rise death is defeated the king is alive I raise a hallelujah we live inside of me A hallelujah. I will dodge the darkness, flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah. your hold on me I'm gonna see in the middle of this
Death is defeated, the king is alive. 